Good morning, and welcome to Tim's Tech Blog for the Week, here at Venom Motorsports. Today we're going to be looking at electrical systems, and I thought we'd begin by having a look at a tool that is really essential, which is called a multimeter. So if you're going to be doing any electrical work, you really need a good multimeter to help you with your troubleshooting. I've got two on hand here, so that you can get a feel and an idea for how they both operate. The first is called an analog meter, and this one's a little bit vintage, but works like a charm. And by analog, I mean that it has a needle that indicates movement, as opposed to the higher tech version, which is digital and has this gadgety screen that you can see with a digital display. Both of these meters will do the exact same job, but one will give you a digital display and one will give you analog. Now, there's plus and minuses to both, and I'm going to indicate that to you in just a second. One of the most common things you're going to be checking and working with, with your electric meters, is continuity. <clears throat> continuity simply means that you have a completed path. Here you have infinite resistance between these two conductive elements, because they're separated by an air gap. And you'll notice that it's indicated here on the analog meter as infinite resistance. However, put the two ends together and you'll notice that the meter moves to indicate that, yep, you indeed do have a completed path of flow and that the resistance level here is very low. Now, according to this meter, the resistance level is zero ohms. So if I was checking an electrical circuit and wanted to see how a switch, for example, was functioning, if the switch was in the open position, I would expect to see this sort of level for resistance. If the switch was closed, you would notice that the needle would deflect over to the zero resistance side, indicating that indeed the switch was closed and had a complete path of flow. How can we use this? Well, here's your typical switch that you're going to find in the ignition system of your bike. If you have a look, it features a four pin connector. The black and the red wire are utilized for the on-off position of the switch, meaning that when you turn the bike on, you should have continuity between these two points. So we're going to try that. And right now, you'll notice that with the 4-pin connector, I'm in the slot for both the red and the black wire, which means that when the bike is in the off position, as it is right now, I would expect infinite resistance in my meter, no continuity. Turn the switch to the on position. I now expect to see continuity and I do, which means that if this was the ignition switch on my bike, when I turn the switch to the on position, the bike would start because there's continuity or a complete path to allow current to flow through the switch. So you might say a switch is simply a device to control current flow, either having current flow on or current flow off. That's all it does. So what sort of other switches do you see? Oh, we have all kinds of switches on your bike. This is a neat switch assembly that some of you will see on an X18 or an X19. And it's kind of gadgety and cool because it does a variety of things. So on this switch assembly you will see on off for your signal lights, a horn, which is again just a switch, and a light switch. Again, all of these just simple switch mechanisms, meaning that they will either have continuity when the contacts are made, for example, moving the switch to the left position, we would now expect to see continuity between the cable connectors for the left rear signal light on your bike. We could again check this for resistance. If we had continuity, we would say, yeah, the switch works great. If we didn't have continuity, that would mean infinite resistance again. We would say, sorry, the switch is faulty. Usually with lighting problems, it's not the switch assembly, it's actually the light. So keep that in mind. Some other tips to pass on to you when you're choosing an electric meter. You want to have one that can allow you to easily switch from resistance to voltage. And the type of voltage that you're going to be concerned with is DC voltage, which simply means a direct current, or in other words, <clears throat> it doesn't alternate. Your home has alternating current, 
normally 120 VAC, your bike has 12 volts direct current. So typically you're going to use the 12 volts DC to measure and see if you have a voltage potential across any two points in your system. Now, your system being the electrical system on the bike, the easiest way to check for voltage is take one of the probes, ground it to the frame of the bike, take the other probe and go to the power line that you see coming from the bike. Now, the power line could be a hot line going to the light bulb or the horn or the starter. You should see 12 volts between these two points and it will be indicated again on the meter scale. The other setting that you have available for these meters is referred to as amperage or current flow. Typically on your bike you're not going to check often for current flow but you might need to. This again becomes a little bit trickier because when you're checking for current flow the voltmeter or the multimeter pardon me must be connected in series. So that's a little bit trickier and we're going to get into that in a second when we have a look at the X19 wiring diagram and have a look at differences between series and parallel and what that means in an electrical circuit. So we'll be back in just a minute and we'll have a look at the X19 ladder diagram and pictorial diagram. Hold on. So here we are having a look at ladder and pictorial diagrams and these come from our X19 bike. So firstly I'll introduce you to this diagram over here and this one is referred to as a pictorial representation of the electrical system on an X19. This is a pictorial representation which is handy it gives you a rough idea sort of what's occurring within the circuit relative from one part to another. It also tells and indicates the color of the various wires used in the wiring harness, but it doesn't really give you an idea in terms of how things work or interact with one another. So what can we get from this particular diagram? Well, the first thing is you'll notice that the color green is used everywhere. Green means going to ground. So green is ground. Red is also a very popular color that's coming off on the left hand side here and typically most of the power supply wires are colored red until they hit a physical device like a switch. So very often they'll change over and then go from a red to a black or sometimes a black to a orange or a black white etc. So when you're having a look at a pictorial It'll show you what the position of a component is and its wiring and color of wire. For example, the start relay here, you'll see we have a ground or uh, <clears throat> a negative wire going from the coil in the relay. So this is the coil in the relay going down here into this green colored wire going back to the green main, which is indeed ground. So what can you do with that? In all honesty, not a whole heck of a lot. So a pictorial you know, illustration of an electrical circuit, in my opinion, isn't really that useful. What I prefer is a ladder diagram. So ladder diagrams have been around now for a number of years, and I find are much handier than your standard pictorial. So what's the difference? Well, we call it a ladder because it's built like a ladder. So to the left we have the positive side of the circuit and this is indicated by this line here again positive. On the right side we have a negative bar indicating the negative side of the circuit and then let's start down here at the bottom and sort of work our way up if you will. We'll start off we have the battery and then you'll notice we have a variety of electrical loads so things like alternators, CDIs, push button relays, ignition coils, lights, and all of these loads are all connected in parallel to each other. Meaning each one of these loads is going to see and experience 12 volts. So as we move up from bottom to top, we start with the battery, which is holding our electrical charge. 
And you'll notice in this area here we have the stator. The stator is actually a component within the alternator being used to produce, through a rectifier, 12 volts DC. So right here, right there at that point, you can have your 12 volt supply being given to you from either the battery or from the rectifier. Which means that when the bike first starts up, it's getting all of its energy from the battery. Once the bike is running, the alternator is producing enough electrical current to su supply all of the electrical needs in the circuit and also to charge up the battery. So if, for example, I was at this point to take off the positive terminal from the battery, the bike would still run because the bike is having all of its electrical needs met through the alternator and the rectification circuit, which means that if your battery is dead and you have a kickstart on your bike, you can use the kickstarter and your bike will work just fine. Moving on, as we move up in this direction along this red wire, you'll notice that we come to a fuse. All of these bikes have some sort of fuse and it can be a cartridge fuse or it could be a fuse very similar to what you'll see in your automobile. But you will indeed have a fuse before you encounter any of the major loads. Now why is this so important? Well, it has a lot to do with protecting all of these other devices downstream from the fuse. So the current flow is going to go up through the fuse to the start switch and then from the start switch, that is the on-off ignition switch if you will, you're going to then supply power to your headlights, your horn, all of your auxiliaries. But that only occurs again when the switch is in the on position. When the switch is in the on position, then the start relay can be engaged by again pressing the start button, which again will allow current to flow down through the circuit to the starter motor and roll the engine over trying to start it. You'll see this separate power takeoff right here before the fuse is used to feed current flow directly into the starter motor when activated by the starter relay. This is important because you'll notice there's a huge difference in the diameter of this wire and that wire. And you might ask, well, why? The wire that is feeding the power directly into the motor starter is a very large diameter because it's dealing with a lot of current flow. If it was very thin, the resistance in the thin wire would cause heat to be produced and the wire would simply burn up. That is, the insulation on the coating of the wire itself would just melt. So we can't have that. So where we have large loads, we'll use large diameter wires. Where we have small loads, we'll use thinner diameters. And again, in this area here, you're looking at about a 16 gauge wire to a 14 gauge wire. The main power supply to the starter will be a 12 gauge wire, just to give you some ideas. So getting back to the circuit. We go through the fuse, the fuse is good, we hit the start switch, we try to start our bike, the bike relay button engages, closes the power supply here that we see going to the starter, and the bike starts. When the bike starts, what happens? The alternator starts to produce power, and as well, sends a signal back to the CDI. The CDI is the capacitive discharge ignition system that you have built into your bike, and it's extremely important. It's sort of the brains of your bike because it controls when spark is released into the ignition coil, that is the primary side of the ignition coil, where the spark is grown. And I say grown because an ignition coil is really a step-up transformer. It'll take a tiny voltage and turn it into a large one, and then discharge that voltage to your spark plug, of course, to create spark in the engine. Now, interesting things to be noted. The ignition coil has a ground. The CDI has a ground. The starter has a ground. So it appears that all of these loads need and must have a proper ground. That's the absolute truth. So the ground in a 12 volt system is just as important as the power supply. Sometimes people get really hung up and say, well, I'll check the power supply, but they never have a look at the grounds. 
you must ensure that you have a good positive ground from the battery to the frame and then from the frame to each one of the loads. So I hope that this diagram has helped you. We're going to go ahead and post this online for you as well in uh, Tim's tech blog for this week's information and you can refer back to it because this basic diagram that you see here, this ladder diagram, is very similar for many many bikes. I hope it helps. Thanks for watching this week and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We appreciate your support. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to email us at VenomMotorsportCanada.com. Have a great day. Enjoy the ride, my friends. Bye-bye.